Let's begin in prayer. I'm so excited to talk to you this afternoon, and, uh, and I hope that what I share with you is going to have some benefit uh, to your life and to your reading scripture and growing in the Lord and walking in the, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit as a disciple, because I know that you're here for more than head knowledge, right? You're here to be changed. You're here to meet Jesus. That's why the Defending the Faith Conference isn't just lecture after lecture. It is talks, it is mass, it is confession, it is fellowship, it is adoration. It involves the whole person for the next few days. And by the time you leave here, hopefully the Lord will have worked in your heart. Maybe you came with questions about direction in your life. Maybe there's something you left back home that you don't know what to do. But when you leave here, hopefully the Lord will give you some direction, some wisdom, some insight into whatever you're facing back home. Because I know that, that God will meet us in a big way. I'm so excited for you, and I'm going to be here till Sunday as, as well. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, oh Lord, we thank you, and we love you. And Lord, we have come from all over the country and all over the world to gather together because we want to see Jesus. We want to see you. We want to experience you, Lord. We come in our brokenness, we come in our needs, we lay down our own expectations, our own plans, and we say, Lord, feed us, direct us, correct us, and comfort us. To you be all the glory for this Defending the Faith Conference. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk to you this afternoon about something that's very, very practical and something that is very, very real in my life. There was an article written in Bar Magazine, Biblical Archaeology Review, a number of years ago, and this article studied the, uh, the relationship between a degree, like a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and a PhD, with your relationship with the Lord, and whether you believe the Lord, or whether you read the Bible as an as a inspired work from God to you. And what they found out was that at the bachelor's level, there was a, a pretty good level of, I believe, I believe. And then as they moved into the master's level, that began to shrink. And by the time they got to the PhD level, they had studied themselves right out of the faith. And that was very small. And so there is this relationship between learning more and more out there and decreasing in your faith. But one of the things that's so beautiful about Franciscan University and all of the great speakers that are lined up for you here is that the more they studied, the more they grew in faith, the more they grew in their understanding, and they were excited about the revelations that they were receiving. I did a podcast a couple years ago about scholars in the United States, biblical scholars, and uh, I came up with some common denominators that separated them from scholars who don't have any faith today. And one of them was that they were submitted to the teachings of the church. Another one was that they, they actually did what they studied. They put it into practice in their life, and their faith began to grow and grow. And the same is for us. You might not have a PhD. You might not have a master's degree or a, or a bachelor's degree, and that's fine. But the more we study as Catholics, the more we should grow in our faith. But we have to do something with it. And that's what I want to talk to you about this afternoon is how do we hear from God on a daily basis and put it into practice and then the next day hear from God again and have this personal relationship with the Lord? When I was a pastor for 12 years, 50 to 60% of our church were former Catholics. 50 to 60% of our church were former Catholics. And one of the easiest ways to take Catholics out of the church was to invite them to what I'm going to share with you today, and that is this. All we had to say was, could you use a word from God today in your life? Could you use direction in your life today? And the looks on people's faces, well, it was amazing. They were like, oh, man, 
Man, I could, I could use something. I can use, I need direction in my life. I need it in my marriage and, and I need it in my finances and, and at work and my children. I need a miracle there, but I need direction. How many of you would say today, I need direction in my life? I could use a word from God in my life. Very good, 23 of you. So that's, there's the problem right there. You don't know if you need a word from God. <laughs> My friends, you need a word from God. That is for absolute sure. I want to start off by telling you just briefly something that I have fallen in love with and something that helps me in being a disciple of Jesus. I see myself as a disciple of the Lord, a follower of Jesus, one who walks with, with him. And, and that is that 2,000 years ago, we don't think about this very often, but 2,000 years ago, there was actually a way to become a disciple of Jesus, to become a disciple of any, any rabbi in the first century. And, and it was pretty simple, actually. You didn't just go and hear Jesus at the stadium in, in uh, Capernaum and say, oh, I'm his disciple, and go to his book table and start buying his tapes and his books, and yeah, I'm all over that stuff. I'm a disciple of Jesus, and you bring your bag home and occasionally read one of the, one of the 73 books he has and uh, listen to it. That'll sink in. If you're Catholic, that should sink in, really, right there. I saw a couple of you going, I thought it was 66. Yeah. No, you're in the wrong, wrong place. So, and, and you listen to his tapes and so forth and say, I, I'm a disciple of Jesus. No, that's not how you became a disciple of Jesus. But you would become a disciple of Jesus by growing up, and from the ages of 7 to 10, you would learn Torah, you would learn Scripture, you would memorize Scripture. From 10 to 13, you would learn more Scripture, and you would learn the tradition of your faith, the tradition of the fathers there. And, and then from 10 to 13, you would also spend about half of your day learning your father's trade. Because when you became 13, 14 years old, you pretty much were making your mind up, what are you going to do with your life? And most of these young boys would end up becoming carpenters or fishermen or make shoes or teach or something like that. But right around that time of 13 to 14 years of age, the great rabbis would come through the towns regularly. And the average number of disciples that a rabbi had was five. Five disciples, that was the average number back then with, with Gamliel and Gamliel's great-grandson. His grandson, great-grandson was, was, was uh, Hillel. Or he, he, Gamliel was the grandson of Hillel, who had 70 disciples. You had Shammai, you had all these great disciples, or all these great, great rabbis out there, but the average number of disciples was five. So how did you become one of those disciples? It was actually very formulaic. Now, I don't know if you think of yourself as a disciple or you just say, well, I'm just, I'm a believer, but there's a difference between being just a believer and being a disciple of Jesus. Being a disciple is 24 seven, it changes your whole life. It is dynamic, it is, it is a very interesting, it's an adventure, it's the great adventure, as I like to say, in following him. So the way you became a disciple is that the, the rabbi would come through your town and he would meet. And over the last seven, eight years, he's got to know you a little bit through the local teachers, maybe your parents, maybe uh, he's heard about you. He's asked questions before. And he, he would say one of two things to you. Number one, he may say, go ply your father's trade. In other words, go do what your father taught you to do. The second thing that he could say is this. Lech achrai in Hebrew. Lech achrai. Come after me. Come follow me. My friends, discipleship was an invitation to become a disciple. You had to hear the formulaic phrase, come after me, come follow me. That's when you were invited to become a disciple of a great rabbi. And that meant that you were going to leave everything behind, follow the rabbi, and your goal was going to be to become like that rabbi, to think and to act like that rabbi. You traveled. You stayed in the same hotels. You listened to him. 
they, they had hotels. The, <laughs> just trust me on that. They, they, uh, they, 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 would, they would listen to how he teaches, how he thinks, how he deals with this situation, with that situation. Jesus said what? He says to you, he says in the word of God, he says, listen, you didn't choose me. I chose you to be my disciple. I chose you. My friends, every one of you here at the Defending the Faith Conference, every one of you is chosen. You are chosen to become Jesus' rabbi, Jesus' disciple. You become his rabbi, you got big problems. You, <laughs> getting ahead of myself there. <laughs> to become his disciple, that's what you are chosen for. Women, God loves you. God thinks you're beautiful. He has chosen you. Today, he chooses you. Men, same thing. God loves you. He chooses you. He loves you so much. Now, what, what did Jesus say? He said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And then he said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29, he says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And then he says in verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble of heart. My yoke is easy. So he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. What does it mean? What is a yoke? When a rabbi says, take my yoke, what they are saying is, take on my worldview. Take on my worldview. See the world the way I do. See marriage the way I see marriage. Everything that Mike Aquilina talked about, see marriage, see raising children, see finances, see forgiveness, see suffering, see everything the way I do through my eyes. And so when Jesus says to you, take my yoke upon you, in, in, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, my friends, you've got to respond to that. You have to respond to that today. You have to say yes or no. That I will take on your yoke, Jesus. I will become your disciple. I will walk with you. And I will go out into the world and I will share the good news with you, with others. You know, my, my, my workshop tomorrow is is about the charisma and witnessing, and I'm going to talk to you about how to share Christ anywhere, anytime, to anyone, and how you go about sharing from a complete stranger to talking about Jesus. How do you do it? And you can do it. And this is what God has called us to do, to go out and to share the gospel with others. But if we're going to say yes to Jesus as disciples, and we're going to take on his worldview. The end of all of that is not just taking it on and say, now I understand. Okay, I get it. I understand about marriage. I understand about forgiveness. I get it. Next topic. But the idea is that you need to put it into practice in daily living. To put it into practice in daily living. And when Jesus chose the disciples... He never said to them, I choose you, be here on Thursday at 7 o'clock. Every week, Jesus, every week on Thursday? Every week, holidays too? It, except Christmas. I'll give you Christmas off. Jesus called him 24-7, didn't he? Because... If you're going to be changed and you're going to be transformed and your thinking is going to change and the way you love your husband or your, or your wife or your friend or the way you raise your children or the way you forgive that, that, co, that colleague at work that's hurt you so much, that boss who really, really hurt you, if you're going to be able to respond to all these situations, then Jesus must be close to you to help you and guide you and give you wisdom and power and strength. We cannot report on Thursday at 7 o'clock and spend the rest of the week out there walking by ourselves, trying to remember some principles. But we've got to get up in the morning 
And all throughout the day, we are aware of the presence of the Lord in our life. We are aware of his word that is teaching me and speaking to my heart constantly throughout the day. When I meet someone, what am I going to tell them when they say, my husband just left me last night. I'm broken. I don't even want to live. Do you just say to them, I'll offer up a rosary? Or do you sit down and do you engage with them and love them and talk to them as though Jesus is talking through you? He's sharing life with them. I say all that to say this. If we are going to live as disciples, we have to have a shape to our day. The shape of your day reflects the love of your life. If you are single, there is a certain shape to your day that reflects the love of your life. If you are married, then the shape of your day changes that reflects the love of your life. If you have children, the shape of your day really changes because of who you love. You see what I'm saying there? The shape of our day changes according to uh, the love of our life. And so if we're in love with Jesus, then the shape of our day changes. It changes. And I want to talk to you about that change in, in just a moment. But let me just take a break right there and, and say this. We are living in very difficult times right now. We are living in times right now where politics, social upheaval, gender identification, all of it is in the news every moment of the day. None of us seem to be able to escape the news that's going on right now in the presidential race and, 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 and everything that's going on. And yet, in the midst of the, the biggest shakeup of modern history that's going on right now, what are the faithful disciples of Jesus doing? Well, they're doing what the other faithful disciples of Jesus are doing. They're watching Tucker Carlson. They're watching Hannity and Laura, and they're staying away from Don Lemon. And you can hear this talk all over, and people the next day, they come up, did you hear what Laura said last night? No, I did not. Why? Did you hear what Tucker Carlson said last night? You would almost think that these are the, 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 the newborn saints of the modern era that there are political champions and they fought the COVID fight for us and they're fighting for Trump right now and, you know, and all of that. And I listen to people talking and I think to myself, you're totally on the wrong playing field here. Totally on the wrong playing field here. Jeff, are you saying politics and all that's not important? No, I'm not saying it's not important, but I'm saying there's something more important than that to give our time to, which is Jesus Christ. For the, the power of the gospel is what's going to turn our country around and turn hearts around. That's what's going to turn it around. I believe that. I believe it. And I see a day, I see a day, I see a day where Catholics are going to lead the Christian charge in our country, not only in Bible study, but they're going to lead the charge in the Christian community in America on evangelization and sharing Christ with others, bringing them in, seeing them transformed and growing up. I see that, right? I do see that right now. I read an article this last week and it was called Evangelicals in Freefall. Evangelicals in Freefall. Dr. Charles Stanley was one of the first television evangelists out of Atlanta, Georgia. He was so conservative and so, so staunch on Scripture. His young son grew up and became a minister, Andy Stanley. And he started leading the whole evangelical movement with cell groups and satellite churches and everything that evangelicals were doing. But over the last five years, Andy Stanley has made a big announcement. He's made a big announcement, and that is that this one man by the name of Harris 
who left his faith and became an atheist, said to him that if you can take apart the Bible, anything in the Bible, you can take it all apart. And was making announcements about how Christianity is not based on Scripture, but an event, the resurrection. And people were starting to follow this, and which doesn't make sense because we know about the resurrection through what? Scripture. We know about that. So the evangelical world is wrestling with all of these things right now uh, uh, among, among their, their churches and other groups as well. And at, that, and at the time when everyone's struggling so much, Catholics are growing in Scripture study, growing in their understanding of the Bible. And, and you take that and you bring it to the, the liturgy and the, the blood of Jesus. Wow! You talk about we're set to have an impact on our culture, but... This is what I was trying to say. We've got to keep our mind and our eyes on Jesus. I don't have the time to get into all these conversations. I don't have the time every night from 7 to 10 to watch all of this. I have a life to live. I'm on a mission from God. And if I'm going to watch 7 to 10 o'clock at night political television, then Jesus is going to have to watch it with me. Imagine saying to the rabbi, let's just sit down and watch some political news for three hours, for a year. <laughs> he said, Jeff, listen to me. So if we're disciples of the Lord and he's called us to be his disciples, what was the one criteria that a rabbi would use in the first century? to determine who they're going to pick. If they were going to pick someone to be their disciple, they had criteria in picking. So I've only got five places, and I'm looking out, and I, I, I have to have some criteria. Now, the criteria wasn't how much money do you have? What kind of influence do you have? Um, wh where'd you go to college? Where do you live? What about your parents? Are they in boards or something? That was not the criteria. The one criteria that a rabbi used in the first century was this. It was, do I think you have what it takes to become like me? That was it. Do I believe you have what it takes to become like, like me? Now, if I don't believe you can become my, like me and I'm a rabbi and, and I'm going to take care of everything for the next five years and you're going to travel with me, and I don't believe that you can become like me, I'm not going to ask you to follow me. But if I believe that you can become like me, I will issue the invitation, Lech Achrai, come follow me. Now that tells me something. And listen to this. The men that Jesus chose, Peter, Andrew, the rest, they were fishermen. A tax collector, Matthew, they weren't chosen by a great rabbi. The idea there is, is that Jesus chooses the unchosen to change the world. And that's you and me. Jesus chooses the unchosen to change the world. But here's the deal. If we're going to become like Jesus, if we're going to think like Jesus, speak like Jesus, vote like Jesus, raise children like Jesus, love our spouse like, like Jesus, if we're going to be like Jesus, then, my friends, we have to be by him close every day. And so getting back to what I was saying, the shape of your day reflects the love of your life. What does the shape of your day look like? What does it look like? Do you meet with Jesus every day? Do you talk to him every day? Do you get together in the word of God every single day and talk to Jesus? Every day. Or is it hit and miss? If it's hit and miss, then it might look like your marriage. Because in marriage, we run into the same thing, don't we? When you're engaged, you're like all over each other. You're just like, I cannot get enough of being with each other. And back in the day, back when I was uh, younger, which were every day earlier, I was younger, but 
I don't know why we say that. When I was younger, well, yeah, that was all when I was younger. We, had, we didn't have cell phones, but we had, these, we had these phones. And then when you turn about 13, 14 years old, you ask your parents if you could get one of those 20-foot cords. And you'd go underneath the stairs, shut the door, and talk to your girlfriend underneath the stairs. And I remember when Emily and I first got uh, together, and, w- and we, we, were, we were friends. And then, uh, then we ended up getting engaged, shape of my day changed. Got married, the shape of my day changed. And before we got married, we were with each other 24, not 24 seven, I was a Christian. I, we were together, <laughs> I, we were together 18 seven, okay? <laughs> We were, to get, we were together 18-7, and, and, and we, would, we would read the Bible, talk about Jesus. We'd pray together. We were in Bible college in Dallas, Texas, and it was just so great. Then we got married. Then we had jobs. We weren't with each other as much. Then we had children, and we weren't with each other as much. And so after about 10 years, you're looking at each other like, it just doesn't feel the way it was when we met, you know? And... So we came up with this amazing invention, date night, Thursdays. Whatever we have to do, we'll sacrifice, we'll get a babysitter, we'll put out the extra four bucks. Uh, Listen, McDonald's is really getting expensive. And, And we will go out and we'll have a date night and we will do what we did at the beginning, right? The shape of your day reflects the love of your life. Where in Jesus, where in your life will Jesus be? Where will Jesus show up in your life on a a regular basis? As I said, with marriage, you can start to hit and miss and your marriage will suffer. It will. It really will. I, I just counseled a couple just the other day. They said, do you have any advice for us before we get married? And I said, yes, start now a regular time of getting together and praying. Pray together as husbands and wives. Husbands, lead, pray. And you don't, I know it's uncomfortable at first. I know it is. For men, ladies, for men, this is not the easiest thing to do. But get together and just say, let's just pray the, the Our Father and the Hail Mary. Let's just get used to praying together. I don't have to go into fanciful prayers, you know. I can do the Our Father. I don't need to start praying, you know, very eloquently and pray with a British accent, you know. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord, I ask you to bless my family today. Your wife said, stop it. Stop it, buddy, you know. Hand me the ketchup. Uh, so you, so you, you don't have to do the, the British accent thing, although that does sound good. <laughs> but, but start praying together. Now, let me tell you what my wife and I do. That's what I wanted to get to. Let me open up my own life to you and show you what Emily and I do every single day. We have made a pact with one another. When we got married 45 years ago, well, this last June 3rd was our 45th anniversary, and thank you. Yep. And uh, when, we, when we got married, June 3rd, 1970-something, we ate, yes. And when we got married, we know what? We looked at each other the day we got engaged and said, when we get married, we will marry to serve Christ together. That's what we said. We'll serve the Lord together with our lives. I only have one life. I want to spend it with you. And I want to serve God with you. And I want to grow old with you. It wasn't, you're so beautiful. And man, you're just, you are so good looking, you know. And I mean, she said those things. But, (laughs) but, 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 but we, we said we're going to get together to serve Christ together. And so we have, that's been our life for 45 years. And it was a year and a half before that that we were engaged. And what we do in our life, every single day in our life, we do the same thing. 
and I have the same breakfast every morning. I know it's boring, but it is good. Every single morning, we have a time of prayer together. And we want to know, God, we don't just want to pray together and say, hey, look, we prayed together. Wasn't that cool? We're such a holy couple. Look, we prayed together, you know? No, when we pray together, we, it's a husband and wife. If you're not married, it's you. And you are going to the Lord because you're a disciple. A disciple meets with Jesus every single day. I want to know the mind of God. I want to know the heart of God. I want my heart to be refreshed so that as I live out my day today, I may encounter situations where I need to know what I'm going to get out of the Bible this morning, whether it's my own life or for somebody else or for my children, my grandchildren, whatever it might be. And so we get together, and I get up at about 5.30 or 6, something about right around there, and I go downstairs, and I make a cup of tea for my wife. We drink green tea from Japan. It's one of the best in the world. I can drink four days of the best tea in the world for the price of one Starbucks coffee. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> we, can, we drink tea in the morning. So I make tea. I make tea for Emily. And I for, get her a cup of tea. I get my tea ready. And uh, I sit down. And about two, about five minutes later, she comes walking down the stairs. I get up and I go over and I grab my Bible and her Bible, and my notebook, and my pens, and my colored pencils, and I bring them over and set them down on the table. And we just sit there quietly for about five minutes, kind of like, Did you sleep good? Yeah, how about you? I don't remember. <laughs> and then, for about an hour every morning, we open up God's Word, and we do Lexio Divina, and we pray. And that time with my wife every single morning is the foundation of my day. I cannot imagine spending one day without her while I'm living there, which I plan on living there, and not doing this. To get together with her every single morning and to open up the Word of God is so powerful. So I want to share with you briefly what we do every day and how you can hear God's Word for you in your life every day, like fresh bread every day, because you can do it. Now, number one, the question is, does the church teach that we can hear God? Yes, it does. The church teaches that not only can God speak to us, but we can speak to God and we can understand God in His Word, we can hear him, but we can also hear him speak in our hearts. True. It's good to know the scriptures. It's good to know the catechism. It's good to know the teachings of the church to begin to listen to the Lord. So when we begin, we use Alexio Divina. Now let me share, share with you how easy this is. Typically it takes about 20 minutes or so, and uh, we stretch ours out quite a bit. And there are some days that we're just having so much fun in the Word of God that it just goes on and on. I say, I got to go. My wife's a biblical archaeologist. She likes to play in the dirt. I like to play in the Bible. That we come together and, uh, and, and we can have a wonderful time there. What is Lexio Divina? Lexio Divina is uh, something that was developed by uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa in uh, 330 to about 3, 350. And it is a four-step exercise to hear God's Word in your life. And so what we do is, number one, you need a Bible. Get a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, get a Bible that you can live in, that you can highlight, you can write in. If you cannot write in the Bible you have, then put that on the shelf and go buy a copy and write in that one. But get a Bible that you can live in, right? So get a Bible, get a, get a notebook, and get a pen and then you're set. Then what are you going to read? Well, we read the gospel of every day. I like reading the gospel for every day because I also have a responsibility. I have a, a daily reflection on Hallow with Jonathan Rumi. How many of you have heard that? 
It's, a, it's, it's I do, a, I do a, a, a five to seven minute reflection every day on the gospel. And oftentimes, what I'm giving you on that came out of my time with my wife in prayer. If you want to get a free sample of that, you can go to hello, hello, www.hallow.com forward slash Jeff Cavins, and they'll give you three months free. If you just want to try it out, I'll be with you every morning or evening. So what we do then is we, we take the gospel reading of the day, and we open up our Bibles, and then she reads the Old Testament reading, and then I read the gospel. Now, here's what you do in Lexio Divina. The number one thing you do is called Lexio. Lexio means to read to read. So the first thing that we're going to do is take, take maybe five minutes or so, three, four minutes, not a long time, and we're going to go to that portion of Scripture, and what are we going to do? We are going to read. Now, you, we read out loud. We read out loud. And so if I took, for example, Psalm 23, and I said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And then I read on. As I am reading that, or my wife is reading that, what are we doing? We are listening for what pops out at us. We're listening for what is basically saying, I'm for you today. Now, I don't want to know why at this point. I'm just doing reading. I'm just listening to what seems to me to be interesting and pop out at me. I'm not trying to interpret. I'm not going into the church fathers or anything else. I'm just a man, a disciple, listening to the Lord. So if I read that whole thing of Psalm 23 to you, I would say, uh, what what's stood out of for the people over here, you'd give me seven or eight different things. People over here, seven or eight different things. Over here, same thing. Is that you would, you would say, well, what really stood out to me was he leads me in the paths of righteousness. Another person would say, the Lord is my shepherd. Another person would say, he makes me lie down in green pastures. So everybody would have received something a little bit different. But the point is, is to nab that and write it down. Uh, we use a little notebook. It's like, an in, it's like a, a, a moleskin notebook. And uh, we can write the year on the front. And after years of doing this, you can look back decades to see what the Lord was sharing with you on that particular date. Because on that notebook, you write the date, the scripture. And then as you read it, you're listening and you write down what it is that popped out at you. That's the first step. Step number two. Step number two is called, first one's lexio. The second one is called meditatio, meditating on that scripture. So in meditatio, what you're going to do is you're going to go and you're going to use your imagination. You're going to enter the text and see yourself with Jesus or in the biblical drama there. And you're going to meditate on this. And it's in the meditating on it that it's amazing how your mind can go into that scripture. Now, remember, you're asking, Lord, what is your word for me today? What are you saying to me today? Because I don't know what today is going to bring. But I do know that if you, if you feed me now, I may know at 4 o'clock why you told me that. But I didn't see 4 o'clock coming. And I didn't see 6 o'clock coming. Had I seen 6 o'clock coming, oh, my, oh, my. But I got in there, and now I'm meditating on it. Meditating in Hebrew is very similar to a cow chewing the cud. I know that's a nice thought. But it is this chewing on it, this meditating on it. And you're going to do that for about five minutes or so. You might write down a few of the questions that you have. The third the third step is called oratio, O-R-I-T-I-O, oratio. Oratio is prayer. It means prayer. And so now, like if, I, if, like if I took Psalm 23 and I told you that what popped out at me was, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And I'm meditating on that, green pastures. Thinking about it, Jesus. 
my schedule, busyness of life, texting, social media, how busy everything is. And, I'm, and, and, and I think God is telling me today to lie down in green pastures. Oratio is the conversation. Lord, what area of my life do you think I need to lie down in green pastures? And if you want me to take a break and lie down in green pastures, when? Now, I could say when in prayer, and I might immediately think today. Now, sooner or later, you have to start believing that God is speaking to you and leading you by the spirit that is within you, that you received. And so when you receive that, lie down in green pastures, I may say in my prayer during a ratio, where is a green pasture? Where can I lay down? And the next thought may come to the adoration chapel at our parish. And I think, you know what? I think I'm going to go. On the way home from work, I'm going to go and I'm just going to lay down, so to speak, in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is telling me I need a break. I need rest. I need to, I need to rest in him today. Okay? Now, the fourth stage of this is contemplatio. Contemplatio is not something you do as much as a place that you arrive. You arrive at a place where you're just... <sighs> enjoying the presence of the Lord. I've got to tell you, this is the highlight of my time with Emily in the morning. When both of us have kind of gone through this, and I'm looking out the window, and she starts to look out the window, and we just, it's quiet for like 10 minutes. Just savoring what the Lord is saying to me today in that reading or gospel reading. Contemplatio is, is something a lot of men do. A lot of men do contemplatio. But they don't do contemplatio in prayer. They do contemplatio with their truck. They go out and they work through the first three steps. They look over the car, you know, and they see what needs to be washed and everything. And they go get all their stuff and they wash it all up and they do all the work and everything. And they, then they sit back, they get, grab their beer, you know, and they sit back and they just look at the car. That's contemplatio. Is this? And then they see if the neighbors are watching. <laughs> That's contemplatio. Contemplatio is at the end of the day, when you've, when you've entertained all kinds of people at your house, they've left, all the dishes are in the dishwasher, everything is cleaned up, and you sit down for a cup of chamomile tea and you just go, <sighs> That's contemplatio. So we do this every day in our life, and we write down in our little journal uh, the things that the Lord is showing us. And then we talk to each other for quite a while about that. And we talk about our kids and our grandkids. We talk about our relationship with each other. You see, get, uh, getting together is so valuable every day to pray. If you're not married, you do this. You can do this. You can even do it with a friend. I'm just saying in my situation as being married, it's very, very valuable. And in fact, we cherish it so much that we don't weaponize it. By weaponizing it, I mean you could say that we got into an argument the night before. We did that once back in 1991. We got into an argument, and the next morning, you know what? I'm going to teach her a lesson. I'm going to act like a disciple. I'm going to not come downstairs. I'll show her you don't mess with me about that thing last night. Well, that's just so mature, isn't it? What would Jesus do? <laughs> And, and so you don't weaponize it no matter what happened, no matter if there's silence, you get together. Even if it's just silent, you read first. I read Lexio, Meditatio, Oratio, Contemplatio, I'm out of here. Okay, <laughs> you don't do that. You don't weaponize it at all. You see, to get together every single day, it is amazing. 
It's amazing. This is the one time during the day where the Lord can straighten her out. I am not giving that up. There's no way I'm giving that up. Okay. So we end up doing this together. And you know what we say to each other oftentimes throughout the day? We say things like, I just have to tell you, I just really love getting together with you every day. I love it. I just love it. I love getting together with you every day. And we've even said things like, if something happened to one of us, I don't know what I'd do. I don't know what I'd do in the morning, you know? But that's come from just years of building and, 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 and loving the Lord together. But then throughout the day, you know what happens? The Lord speaks throughout the day with that word. And that word might be from someone that comes up to me and says, I'm burned out, I'm toast, I'm out of here. Can I talk to you about something? Can I show you what the Lord showed me in prayer this morning? Yeah, and I talk to them. I'm finding that throughout the day, I have so many opportunities to share the Lord with other people. And the Lord's word feeds me throughout the day. And so if you do this every single day, think of the wealth. Studying the Bible is one thing. Praying scripture is another thing. My good friend Tim Gray has a wonderful book uh, called uh, Praying Scripture for a Change. It's really a good book. And, uh, and that's why we're, we're, we're doing it. But here's what I want to share with you. I know what a conference is like. And I, I was a pastor for 12 years, you know, every week and every Wednesday teaching and teaching. And, and I know what it is to hear something where you're thinking to yourself, man, I want to do that. But then in four hours from now, forgetting and this is what the gospel parable of the sower says, is that they receive the word joyfully, and then the cares of this world, the desire for riches, tribulation and persecution, it robs us of the word that was planted. You know that's a word from God. You know that that's God speaking to you, saying, I'm waiting for you every day. I'm waiting for you. I want to talk to you every single day. You know that's him. And we have to protect that. Now, what my wife and I do, and I'll, I just want to share this with you, and I'll be, I'll be done with my introduction, I, is, is, the, is that what we do is that uh, Father Mike Schmitz and I came up with a, an idea. We both like journaling. We were talking one day, and uh, we're talking about developing a, a journal, not for the Lexio Divina so much, but a journal that you could keep track of the insights and the gold in your life. And so Father Mike and I just developed, it's, I don't have any here, I'm so sorry, that was so dumb. But um, <laughs> Greek is, that's dumb for stupid. But it's an Ascension Press. But it's called the Insight Journal. And what we developed there was we wanted a place where when we hear something, whether it's Lexio Divina, a lecture, um, a song, what, whatever it is, and it's an insight about marriage or about, about uh, money or about decision-making or life or whatever it is, that you have a place where you can write down in that one journal what you discovered, the insight you had, and you think to yourself, I'm never going to forget that. I'll never forget what Scott Hahn said 11 years ago at the Defending the Faith. Yes, you did. You did. I'll never forget it. So you write it down there. That's the gold. So we, anyway, we put together this journal, the Insight Journal, and, and it's a way for you to uh, categorize all of these insights that you're gaining over the years. And when times get tough, you can go and look at the word uh, worry, fear, and see all the things that God has said to you over the last two or three years that dealt with fear. That quote, that scripture verse, that advice and confession, whatever it might be, you keep track of the gold. You keep track of the insights. Don't let the insights that God gives you and the words that he gives you on a daily basis, don't let them just fly away. Don't just enjoy them for like 20 minutes and then move on. Capture it. 
Write it down. Go back to it. Build on it. And so I have an insight journal, and I have created three other insight journals. One of them is for Dominic, my grandson. Another one is Francesco, my grandson. Another one is for Fiona, my granddaughter. And I keep an insight journal for each and every one of them so that when I come up with something where I think Dominic and Francesco need to know that, and I might not be here when they're 25 years old. I might not be here the day they're married. I might not be here when they have kids. And I want to speak into their life. Dominic, I thought of you today. And there's this bit of information about how to treat your wife. And I write it down. And three weeks from now, something else and when he turns 18 years of age, I'm going to come to him and to each of my grandkids. I'm going to say, Dominic, Francesco, Fiona, Grandpa's been thinking about you. You've been on my heart all these years. This is what I have gathered for you for wisdom and insight for living. This is what has changed my life. And I would have never f remembered it had I not written it down. It's yours. This is from my heart to yours. That's what I plan on doing. And so when we, when we pray with our Bible in our notebook, we have our pen, the Bible, to knees. And we hear from God for daily living. And we want to live that. Live it every day. Tomorrow's bread will be fresh. Every single day it will be fresh. And tomorrow will be a new opportunity. And I'll just end with this. Before the Soviet Union collapsed, I was a part of a team that smuggled Bibles into the Soviet Union. And we had a master plan of how we were going to smuggle Bibles into the underground church and get them to the pastors out in the countryside. And uh, there was a team of about 12 of us, and I was the only one that got caught at the border. And uh, they brought me to a different place. They began to question me and ask me all kinds of questions. They took a lot of what I had, but they did not get uh, most of the Bibles that were down into a, a compartment. My buddies got through. The rules were, if any of us get caught, the rest just go. You don't hang around. So there I was. And I ended up eventually finding them at a hotel a day later. And our mission was to go to Red Square. And we went to Red Square. We were to stand in a certain place. We were to stand in a certain place and wait for someone to come up to ask us, do you have bread from the baker? And the answer was, yes, and it's fresh. Follow me. And that happened on that day. And we got into a car with all these suitcases and went on a two-hour two drive out into the country. And I said to the guy, I said, how long have you? He looked in the rearview mirror and he went like this. No talking. So we just drove for about two hours thinking, I hope I'm in the right car. And we got to this, uh, this, this uh, uh, train station, got out. He pointed to a big building. He just pointed to it, got into his car, took his bags out, got in the car and left. And we, like, and we took all of our stuff and we went into this abandoned building. There was no cars or anything. We started walking down the, the, the stairs and we started hearing singing. We got down to the bottom. And there were 500 believers in the basement of this abandoned building in the winter, worshiping and praising God. And they didn't have Bibles. And they would take place, one after, take, 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 take turns, one after another, they would take turns with a man or a woman standing up and reciting a chapter of one of the Gospels. And then it was the next person's turn, they stood up and they would be Psalm 119, and they would say it. And I thought to myself, how hungry they are for fresh bread every day to travel for days just to hear 
the word of God in their life and how rich we are. There's an embarrassment of riches, isn't there, in our lives? And we have the Bible and we have access to it every single day. And so I just want to encourage you at the beginning of this conference that God wants to speak to you. And I know this isn't a highfalutin theological talk. This is just life. And, and God wants to meet with you every day and he wants to lead you and, and guide you. And that's what discipleship is and that's what he's called you to. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the life you have given us. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gift of scripture. And I thank you for uh, speaking to us every single day. You are so good. You are so good. Lead us and guide us, I pray, in your name. Amen. Amen. So I want you now to, for the rest of the conference, to just dig in and get as much as you can. And when you get home, go after it. Fight for it. Fight for your family. Fight for the country. Fight for your relationship with the Lord. Fight like you're the third monkey on the ramp to Noah's Ark. <laughs>